Hey everybody, so let's imagine a conversation between a pro-life Christian and me, a pro-choice genius. The Christian begins by saying that human personhood, with all the meaning and sanctity that holds, begins at conception, the moment the sperm meets the egg. And that for that reason, when a mother aborts her pregnancy, it's wrong, murderous. And then I'm like, that argument doesn't hold up to scrutiny. What is it about a zygote that makes it a person with human rights? It doesn't feel pain. It doesn't make decisions or plans. It doesn't love. It doesn't have any desires, including the desire to live. It doesn't think. In fact, it has none of the characteristics that we normally associate with personhood. And then the Christians like, okay, let's move the goalposts a tiny bit. Maybe the zygote isn't a full-fledged person yet, but they certainly have the potential to be one, and that potential should be preserved. And then I'm like, why are we placing this potential line here? Why aren't you mad that I'm not always having sex? Why aren't you mourning when women have periods? There's just no actual reason we're using the zygote to delineate between the potential for personhood and the lack thereof. And then the Christian says, the reason we should make a line here is because conception is when the human soul comes into existence. And then I put on my sunglasses and say, well, that's a faith-based argument. And if you want our society to restrict access to abortions on that basis, what you're really doing is forcing people to hold to your religious values. And I don't want to live in a Christian theocracy. And then the Christians like, why not? Jesus died for your sins. And the conversation ends soon after. Now, of course, this is a caricaturish debate I've constructed here. Obviously, it could get more complicated. The Christian could come out of it looking better, making more nuanced, more secular, or secular-looking arguments. And I could keep responding in more and more intricate ways, like an absolute chad. But here's the thing. I don't want to do that today, and that's for one simple reason. I think that this conversation is a bit of a mirage. An intellectual narrative that doesn't really map on to the way that this issue works in reality. It is the argument we think we're having, that we fantasize about having, when we argue about abortion. Unplanned is an anti-abortion Christian propaganda film made by Pure Flix, the studio behind the God's Not Dead trilogy. Based on a memoir by a pro-life activist, the movie centers around Abby, a woman who happily works for Planned Parenthood for six years until one day she goes to assist with an abortion, sees how terrible it is, and becomes a pro-life activist. On the surface, Unplanned certainly seems to be invested in the ideas we've talked about so far. Characters frequently talk about how life begins at conception, about how zygotes have hearts that are filled with love for their mommies. And the opening scene in the movie is a bit of body horror. As the protagonist watches a fetus avoid its abortion, the message is clearly that this little dude is a person who's like, no, don't do this. Don't do this! <laughs> but as we dive deeper into the film, what we find is something that's a lot more nuanced and complicated than what those points might suggest. A movie that continually works to challenge and complicate some of our ideas about what abortion means to society and what it might mean to the pro-lifers who hate it. Unplanned is a very interesting movie, and I'm excited to unpack it today. So with that out of the way, part one, the terms of the conversation. As I stepped into Unplanned, I expected it to be a bit like God's Not Dead. You know, in the same way this kid gets into a debate with his atheist professor over the existence of God, I thought there'd be some good pro-life person, some bad or confused pro-choice person, and then they'd duke it out in the marketplace of ideas. But as it turns out, this is not the case. Over the course of the film, there just isn't any argument for the idea that life begins at conception, any argument against abortion. There was nothing I could really sink my teeth into and debunk. 
Instead, the movie is primarily focused on the real-world practice of abortion, on making the case that the people who do them, specifically Planned Parenthood, are bad and use shady methods. And Unplanned does this by making two main claims. First, that Planned Parenthood performs abortions in unsafe ways. In the first act of the movie, we learn that the protagonist, Abby, had a chemical abortion that took poorly and caused her a lot of pain. After the scene where we watch her writhe in agony, we see her call Planned Parenthood and apparently they warned her about none of these risks. They just didn't give a shit, I guess. What happened to gently emptying my uterus? That is what I was told would happen. Look, I'm sorry, but I have another patient. Later on in the film, the abortion doctor performs a botched operation on a kid, punctures her uterus. You know what? I don't care if you're comfortable. Just do it. And instead of calling an ambulance, the mean abortion lady is like, do you know how bad the PR from this would be if we sent her to the hospital? We have to figure this out on our own. In both these situations, the point is clear. Planned Parenthood is an outright dangerous, craven institution, one that regularly jeopardizes the health of its patients. Second, Planned Parenthood desperately tries to sell people on abortions because abortions make a de money. This is an enormous part of the film. Probably 20 to 30 minutes of it are dedicated to this point. But for our purposes, this little speech that the abortion lady makes conveys the point just fine. Fast food outlets look to break even on the hamburgers they sell. Do you know how they make their money? No. On the french fries and the soda. I don't understand. Abortion understand. is our fries and soda. Abortions are like fries at McDonald's. Planned Parenthood just sells those suckers as hard as they can, and that's why they're providing the service. So, looking at these two points, we can start by saying that this is some belligerent nonsense, right? For one, there's just no evidence that Planned Parenthood frequently does malpractice, doesn't tell women the side effects of their medication, puts women's lives at needless risk. How often does that happen? I found no research to suggest that it's some big problem. All we have to go on is this one lady's dubious and transparently agenda-fueled memoir. And as an aside, I feel it's appropriate to say here that while, yeah, abortions are a medical procedure that do come with risk, it's a whole lot less risky than the other thing pregnant people can do. Give birth. A point which never comes up in this movie for obvious reasons. And as far as the other point is concerned, that Planned Parenthood constantly upsells abortions because it's how they make all their sweet blood money, again, where's the proof? I've never seen anyone talk about this being a serious problem. And while I won't say I did a scientific study by any means, I did ask on Twitter for people to share their experiences getting an abortion from Planned Parenthood. And literally, a few dozen people DM'd me, the vast, vast majority of whom said that Planned Parenthood was nothing but neutral, just told them their options in a non-judgmental and helpful way. In fact, if anything, Planned Parenthood is forced to downsell abortions in a lot of cases. In Texas, where this movie literally takes place, the law requires that women get told inaccurate information about abortion, about increased chances of breast cancer and infertility. They have to hear the baby's heartbeat and see an often medically unnecessary ultrasound. They have to get state-mandated counseling 24 hours before their abortions, causing many women to have to pay far more to stay overnight in the town where the clinic is, a price many can't pay. It's repulsive, honestly, and the movie comically never brings any of this up. But okay, as heated as all of this makes me, it's not actually the point I wanted to make here, and it's not that important to this video. Rather, I mostly just want to make one observation here. That the way Unplanned focuses all its energy on convincing us that the people who give abortions are bad fundamentally undermines the idea that this film is actually opposed to abortion. 
Let's pretend for a second that every claim this movie makes against Planned Parenthood is true. They are medically negligent, and they do sell abortions like hotcakes or french fries, I guess. What would our takeaway from that actually be? What would we do with all of that newfound info? Outlaw abortions and force every clinic that provides them to shut its doors? Well, no. That seems a bit dramatic, doesn't it? My reaction would be to just solve the problems at hand, fix the broken methods of Planned Parenthood. If, for instance, we made abortions easily accessible free healthcare, as we obviously should, then we wouldn't have to worry about corporations trying to sell them, or about them endangering people's lives because of bad PR. The most obvious critique we can read into the case made by Unplanned is not abortion bad, but rather private healthcare bad. The current state of abortion is bad. And, you know, that's pretty strange, right? Why would this anti-abortion propaganda film center its argument on this extremely specific thing that has nothing to do with abortion? It doesn't quite add up, does it? Part 2. The Moral Stakes of the Conversation Okay, we'll get back to that can of worms in a little while, but for now, let's change the topic to another interesting aspect of this movie. In the first act of Unplanned, as Abby, the protagonist, volunteers at Planned Parenthood for the first time, she encounters a pro-life protester. He yells at some lady to not get an abortion and calls her a baby murderer. Does daddy know that you're here? Yeah, yeah. Does he know that you're killing his little grandbabies right now? Now, of course, I hate this guy, and I think people like him in real life are the scum of the earth. But the interesting thing is, the movie wants us to hate him. In a later scene in the film, Abby talks to a nicer, pro-life woman, and she's like, that guy's awful and we've asked him to stop. Anti-abortion people shouldn't act like this. It's unhelpful, wrong, lacking in the compassion that all people should have. So we can ask them to stop, and we do, but we can't force them to do anything. So for what it's worth, I think you're right, Abby. There's something kind of unsettling about this, isn't there? To be clear, I do think it's better to be nice and pro-life than to be awful and cruel and pro-life, but I have a hard time accepting that this could be a really important distinction within the film's ethical framework. I mean, abortion is supposed to be murder, right? That's the go-to position that the film constantly shoves down our throats. The pro-life people prey over barrels of aborted pregnancy material, describing the lost children as having names only known to God. They directly compare America's abortion culture to the Holocaust. The truth is, you've just cited three examples of injustice. Slavery, segregation, and the Holocaust. That can only occur when a whole segment of the population is dehumanized. And that's exactly what Planned Parenthood does to the unborn. But, you know, my reaction to the Holocaust wouldn't be to tone police its protesters. Act like they're doing something wrong for being mean to the Nazis. That would be ridiculous, right? Rude words are a justified response to mass murder. And yet, this notion that we should always be nice and polite and forgiving about abortion is one of the most important threads in the movie, one we can see most clearly through Abby's arc. When she starts getting involved with abortion, taking on more responsibility at Planned Parenthood, her husband and parents both dislike it, but they do so in a really low-key, kind of detached way. They say a few words here and there about how they hope she'll stop with all this, and about how life begins at conception, but they don't really engage further than that. This is particularly strange in the husband's case. Here's a guy who explicitly believes that a life worthy of human moral considerations is created at conception. Okay. Pretend for a second that you're someone like me who believes all abortions are bad. And yet he marries Abby, no questions asked. And, you know, I can't even fathom that, marrying somebody that I know to be a serial murderer. It seems deeply incongruous to me. 
And then, at the end of the film, after Abby stops working for Planned Parenthood, she cries that she was responsible for the deaths of 60,000 children. And her husband tells her, God will forgive you. You thought you were doing the right thing, but now you've seen the light. You did what you thought was right, baby. <laughs> oh, why do I feel so ashamed? Abby, look at me. I love you. And so does God. He'll forgive you if you ask. <laughs> Then, at the very end, she's proudly accepted by all the pro-life people as she delivers a stirring speech. And all of this is just… it's whack, right? Like, I get that Christians believe that God can forgive any sin, but they don't tend to believe that society should always be responsive to that fact, right? If Abby actually had killed 60,000 people, it's hard to believe that everyone would just be like, It's okay! God forgives everything! You thought you were doing the right thing! We love you, sweetie! You're fine! Don't even worry about it! No, they would want to throw her in jail, execute her, probably. If the conservative Christian agenda that Pureflix is advocating for were really so aligned with total carte blanche forgiveness for terrible crimes, you'd think they'd talk a bit more about prison abolition, you know, forgiving actual criminals, which of course they don't ever do. So, like in the last section of the video, we've hit a roadblock here, another place where the film seems to break down. But this case is arguably even more serious and thought-provoking. Before, we were talking about the arguments that Unplanned uses about how they didn't meaningfully counter a pro-choice perspective. But at the end of the day, maybe we could just chalk that up to the way that propaganda sometimes works. It's effective for the film to spend most of its time positioning abortion as a crude, shady, capitalist conspiracy. It taps into the audience's feelings of disgust and victimization. And maybe that is, in some sense, more important than providing a genuine, intellectually persuasive, pro-life position. But this situation is different, right? Because here, the very center of the film, its moral code, its message, becomes a contradictory mess. In one breath, it regards abortion as one of the worst things that could ever happen, comparable to the Holocaust. And in the next breath, it treats it as this imminently forgivable and understandable sin, the sort of thing we shouldn't be mean about, the sort of thing we should just move on from. And we're left wondering, what should we even feel about abortion? What should our reaction be to its existence? What is this propaganda film even about, and how could it be accomplishing whatever that is? How does this movie work? Part 3. The Absence of the Conversation So, uh, why are we talking about this movie in the first place? Is this just the Big Joel Power Hour where we dive deep into a bit of interesting art for the raw pleasure of it? Well, yes, but also no. Let me tell you about what really motivated me to make this video. Recently, I was watching videos by some of my absolute favorite lefty YouTubers, Ian Danskin, aka Innuendo Studios, and Cody Johnston, aka Some More News. This is what Ian says about abortion in his recent piece called I Hate Mondays. If you wanted fewer abortions, you would promote comprehensive sex education and easy access to contraceptives, because that's all that has ever reliably lowered abortion rates in any country. All making it a crime does is determine whether the abortion happens in a doctor's office or a motel room. This is what Cody says in a video about Ben Shapiro. The actual data shows that countries where abortion is illegal either have the same amount of abortions or even more. And what actually reduces abortion is access to contraceptives and better sex education. It's what has been factually determined through multiple studies using the best data we have. Now, the context of these statements are certainly different from each other, but the message is roughly the same, right? That making abortions illegal will not reduce them, and that this point is a reasonable and persuasive argument against banning them. Now, this is obviously not a call-out of either of these boys, these beautiful sons of mine, but I will say that this argument 
utterly baffles me. For me to be a pro-lifer, one who ever wanted to ban abortion, I'd have to accept two bad premises. First, and probably most importantly, that a fetus at every stage of its development is a person or person-like entity who is owed various moral considerations. And second, that those considerations trump the autonomy and safety of the mother. In other words, I'd have to think abortion was murder. And if I accepted that, then no, I wouldn't be okay just making abortions legal because making them illegal wouldn't prevent them. This is 600,000 abortions per year we're talking about. And making contraception more available and teaching more people about it would make that number go down, but tons of abortions would definitely, definitely still happen if that's all we did. And considering that, if I were a pro-lifer, perish the thought, I wouldn't be down to just say, well, whatever, let's just let that go. This systemic mass murder is just part of living, I guess. No, honestly, I'd probably say that we just haven't tried hard enough yet. Haven't put in the enormous amount of work we'd need to fight against this unbelievably bad thing. So to me, this argument is kind of incoherent. It sounds common sense and reasonable, but it just doesn't seem like it works. Seem like it could ever convince the people who actually need convincing. I see arguments similar to this all the time. Points like it are pretty common in discussions about abortion, and again, I'm not trying to pick on these two. But it does leave me with a question. How does this conversation happen? What does abortion mean to many of the people who talk about it? And watching Unplanned in all of its propagandistic strangeness helped me make sense of it, at least a little. Because within this film, abortion is not a concrete idea. The sort of thing we can analyze for its material impact and make a judgment about. Rather, it sees the practice as this peculiar and contradictory social object. An act of horrendous violence that we should not treat as such. A terrible crime with no substance or gravity. What's more, even as we're assured over and over again that abortion is wrong, every time we try to actually look at it, it escapes our grasp. All we get to see or really think about is the people who do it. How bad Planned Parenthood is. How George Soros is responsible. Have you ever seen the names of our donors? Soros, Gates, Buffett. So abortion here is really just an absence, a trick of language that is amenable to any situation, that can shift its meaning at the drop of a hat to suit the case the movie wants to make. And sure, by the end of Unplanned, we might feel disoriented, like we can't quite conceptualize abortion as a moral problem that needs solving. But the movie doesn't need to care about that, because it gets something way more valuable in return. The ability to produce a set of claims that look real and important, but which could never be countered or explored in any way that matters. If I said, Planned Parenthood isn't an awful institution and it doesn't do any of the weird things you say it does, they could say, that's not the point. Abortion is a problem on the face of it. If I said, fine, Planned Parenthood is bad and abortion should be part of free national health care, they'd say, give women free abortions? You'll only get more abortions that way. If I say that abortion isn't murder, they'll respond with viscera and body horror and people People praying over barrels of fetuses. If I say, well, if abortion is murder, why aren't you acting like it? They'll say, uh, because we're Christians. Christians are fine with murderers. In lieu of an actual conversation, the sort of fun hypothetical I began this video with, all we find is a smokescreen, a series of double binds and manipulations that provide the fiction of a real argument, but that doesn't come with the burdens of an argument. Evidence, thought, justification, standing by your convictions, the possibility of being wrong. 
But when I really thought about it, I realized that this sort of rhetoric that Unplanned uses, its way of positioning abortion as an absence, isn't as simple as it just being a propaganda film that wants to manipulate us. Rather, it relates in a deep way to the way abortion conversations so often work. It is reflective of our general abortion discourse, at least in the US. Like, one of the most important messages of Unplanned is that making abortions available doesn't reduce the number that people get. Abby starts the film believing the opposite, but then learns progressively that abortion only begets more abortion. And then, you know, Cody Johnston comes in and looks at an argument like this one that a pro-lifer makes. The absolute level of the activity decreases, but what's left is going to be illegal just by logical necessity. And he goes, no, no, no. Legalizing abortions doesn't increase the rate at which people get them. Just look at the actual statistics for one second. But if the people behind Unplanned saw those statistics and believed them, do you think they'd become pro-choice? Well, maybe. People can be convinced by strange things, but I do doubt it for the reasons I talked about before. And if I came over to Cody's house to vibe and chill and said, Hey bro, I actually found a set of policies that would allow us to ban abortion effectively. Now we can needlessly steal women's bodily autonomy to our heart's content. Do you think he'd say, shit, my pro-choice position is destroyed, ban away? Well, no, probably not, right? If he sees this video and I'm wrong, he can feel free to correct me, but I do hope that I'm not wrong. So, this point has no purpose to the people saying it. Despite how we might act, there's no way to this claim being proven or disproven. Because no one here, not me, or Ben Shapiro, or Cody Johnston, or Unplanned, or Ian Danskin, could change their minds because of it. It just wouldn't make sense for that to happen. In essence, then, it's a conversation about nothing. But, see, maybe that's the point. Maybe we want to talk about nothing, and maybe that's for one simple reason. That we can't or don't want to talk about the elephant in the room. About what abortions actually mean on an ethical level, about who benefits from getting them, about what makes a moral person a moral person. And, you know, I think we avoid this stuff at least partly because if we did talk about it, it might create some level of discomfort. The people behind Unplanned might hate abortion. They might legitimately see it as murder and think that the people who get them should go to jail. I don't know. But either way, a statement as bold as that probably wouldn't land well among the film's audience. Many of the people watching this movie might have a real problem with abortion, but not necessarily a coherent one, one that comes to them through careful moral thinking. They might find the practice upsetting, ungodly, and worthy of being banned, but nonetheless, they still might not be willing to truly conceptualize it as murder. To look into the eyes of their parents and children and siblings and spouses and say, you killed a baby, like so many of you killed a baby. And so, the film doesn't tell them that. I mean, it does, but not in a way that actually counts for anything, or that we're forced to take seriously. Meanwhile, the pro-choicers among us might be 100% fine with abortion, but the world we're talking to is more complicated and messy than that. Many people might think abortion should be legal, but have deep reservations about the practice. Think they're immoral and distasteful, but necessary sometimes. The lesser of two evils, a tragic reality. Again, that's not necessarily some kind of morally rigorous position, the sort of thing everybody thought through. No, it's just the way a lot of us end up feeling about it. And so, maybe we don't want to tell those people, I don't think there is any significant ethical problem with abortion, no reason to stigmatize them or look at them as this sad, unfortunate procedure. I think they're fine. That can be painful to say. Feel like you're alienating reasonable folks, or like you're not sensitive enough to this serious and sometimes very upsetting issue. 
And so, instead of going with either of our options, saying that abortion is fine or saying that they're extremely not fine, we turn ourselves inside out to make strange arguments and moral claims that justify some of our beliefs without challenging others. Does it matter if making abortions available and accessible will increase or decrease the rate at which people get them? Well, not really, right? Not when you get down to the bone of the issue. But we'll keep having these conversations about this and other equally vapid subjects. Because we don't want to talk about abortion. Anything's better than talking about abortion. Hey everybody, thanks so much for watching this video. I know it was a bit intense or whatever. Uh, like, comment, subscribe if you want to. I imagine this video isn't going to get monetized considering the subject matter, so of course any money you wanted to give me on Patreon would be appreciated. Uh, cool. Anyway, now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Do 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 do. Dan DeFord, parentheses, The Deacons, asks, What are your top three favorite donuts? Please note, an eclair is not a donut. Uh, okay. Crullers, apple cider donuts, and just normal glazed donuts. Okay. <laughs> bye. Hope you, hope you liked it. Okay, bye. Hope you enjoyed this video. And I hope you have a nice day.